Dr. Sandy Laura Kramers, one of the eye surgeons of Visionary Eye Doctors. Thank you again for joining us for the EYE show. Today we're going to do the master class on diet recommendations by Dr. Kramers, and we're going to go through a story I've told many times on previous podcasts and uh, on YouTube, but I think it's worth talking about because I want to go through all the recommendations I tell patients every day. Uh, there's quite a lot of controversy on what doctors recommend to patients for their diet. There's a lot of controversy in what's the best diet for you. As I mentioned in a previous podcast, I was stunned to see the amount of data and statistics in any baseball game. So if you are following baseball or uh, I mentioned uh, race car driving and so forth, there is a lot of data collected second by second on the player, on the, the team, uh, the dynamics of the heart rate and blood pressure and cholesterol level on the players and how the team works and there's so much data in baseball and different types of sports I was just absolutely flabbergasted because we do not have that same type of minute second by second data in medicine and surgery much less diet so it's getting there right but it's just we're, we're still behind baseball, which is kind of sad, but true. So I'm going to tell you the story, which I mentioned to you years ago, I mentioned years ago, but I think it's, again, a beautiful story. And so my journey into understanding diet really started in a way in medical school, uh, which was the fact that we didn't talk about diet. We, I think we've maybe got an hour of nutrition, maybe that, maybe zero. And then I remember many years ago when we had had our second child, we have six children, my father was told he had pre-diabetes and my dad, we're from South America, from Bolivia, and he's a typical, he, he used to be a meat and potatoes guy. And it, it, he's a cardiothoracic surgeon trained with uh, Dr. DeBakey and Dr. Cooley, the first two heart transplant surgeons in the country. And so very tough surgeon man went crazy and said, um, he, well, he didn't say anything. He just literally went from being majorly overweight, kind of metabolic syndrome, which a lot of surgeons are overweight. If you look around, they're working so hard, they don't take care of themselves. They just eat what's available in the cafeteria. And then they just start putting on pounds. And then they realize and wake up one day that they're not doing any better than their patients. And then they have a wake up epiphany. This is what happened to my dad. So he immediately dropped all his carbohydrates he would call me and say you know guess how many carbohydrates i've had today i'm like i don't know dad he's like zero and i said dad that's impossible i was like zero he'd say zero and i said dad that's impossible it's like i had zero <laughs> and so it turned out he probably was having zero because he would have a lot of bones with water like he'd, you know uh, fry his bones in the oven and then put it in water and have like soup and soup and soup without really any carbohydrates in that soup so he, he lost the weight. He completely cured his diabetes. This was many years before Dr. Fung, who's a wonderful, wonderful um, nephrologist uh, who has wonderful YouTube videos. Highly recommend. I'm trying to get his first name because I should know his first name. Uh, but wonderful doctor on YouTube that recommends uh, wonderful ways to cure diabetes. And, I, and a lot of people, I think the first time they've ever heard of doctor uh, of, of the idea of curing your diabetes was Dr. Fung. Uh, but he's, my, my dad was talking about this, I think now 23 years ago, which is a amazing that I didn't pick up on this, but it's true. So, so then he would call us child abusers in our face for feeding our children bread. And I was like, my husband's from the Netherlands. So I was just like, we're going to eat bread because we're a European family in that sense. And we would, you know, drive an hour to get good bread anyway. So it was quite a difficult situation when my dad would come visit us because he would go through the house looking at like Cheerios, which I thought was relatively healthy and saying, this is poison. This is poison. And, you know, so we have this, this closet that we call the poison closet because it's all the carbohydrates, which are not even that bad. We don't even eat donuts or anything terrible, but he felt any grains was poison. And this is for years, for 23 years, okay? So fast forward to when I started here at Visionary Eye Doctors, a friend of mine named, um, I'll just tell you her first name, uh, Ceci told me about her sister's story, which was, uh, Ceci was from a family of 11 children and the oldest uh, child, the, the, do the girl died of breast cancer and she left behind a family and it was very devastating and then I, I heard the story this way um, so please forgive me to the family if I get any details wrong but what happened was that two weeks later the youngest sister Lily found a lump in her breast. She went to the doctor, she was found to have metastasis of breast cancer to her lungs spinal cord pericardium, the sac around her heart, and her liver. 
and she was given three months to live. And that's the way we were taught also in medical school and residency. Once the cancer hits the liver, you usually have three months to live. So as she was having this horrific diagnosis, she was, I think, 43 or 45 when she got the diagnosis. She had three little kids. They, the whole family was at her older sister's house taking out all the stuff, getting her house ready to probably just moving her stuff out. And somebody happened upon, I think Lily happened upon the older sister's diary where she found that the older sister was looking into the Gerson diet, which was very controversial, still is controversial. And so Lily did a lot of research, decided against medical advice of this world-renowned breast cancer doctor in Washington, D.C. that just finished taking care of her older sister and is published and as well-known, uh, went against her advice and decided to do the Gerson diet. And the Gerson diet is a diet that started probably in the 60s and 70s. And again, please forgive any kind of date issues here. Uh, but basically, it's a diet requiring quite a bit of everything organic, no coloring your hair, no putting uh, furniture polish in your house, no chemicals, no pesticides. Uh, what you clean your uh, clothes with is very natural. Uh, everything, again, is organic. You can only have certain foods. It's a kind of a somewhat, uh, I would say you can have potatoes if they're organic. You can have spinach, but there's a whole lot of other things you can't have. Enemas, and I mean enemas, you know, three times a day or, or sometimes more is required. Most patients go to Mexico to have this one-week training on how to do the Gerson diet. So Dr. Gerson was practicing in the United States, and from what I could tell on the internet, this was studies, the test uh, research I did about now, oh gosh, almost 10 years ago, the light, his license was pulled and he was kicked out of the country. And I still do not understand why, except to say, around the same time, there was a Dr. Mormon in the Netherlands. And my husband knows a woman who did Dr. Mormon's diet when he was back in the Netherlands many, many years ago. Dr. Mormon was an oncologist who had an established diet approved by the Royal Academy of Doctors in the Netherlands. And from one month or one year to the other, his license was also extracted from him and he was kicked out of the country. So I don't know why that happened. I don't know if they um, were, there was false advertising. I don't think so because these were patients in both of their, from what I could read about them, they were taking the worst of the worst patients that had tried everything. Uh, they were going to die pretty much anyway. They were going to try a radical diet change to probably possibly see if they could extend the life of the patient. So I don't know what happened, but this is the story that I've, I've, I know of. So Lily told me about her Gerson diet, and we have this little funny joke where uh, when I said enemas, she said enemas. I was like, enemas? What do you mean enemas? And she said, well, you know, I said, I, you know, you get a tube, you fill it up with coffee grounds, you stick it up your butt, and you flush it out with water. I was like, how big is this tube? And um, her sister, uh, her older sister, my friend, Sassy, pulls out her tube, which is about probably maybe the size of my thumb, a pretty big tube. And Lily starts laughing and laughing and laughing. And I'm like, I look at my friend, Sassy. I was like, Sassy, why are you la why, why is she laughing? And Sassy's like, I don't know. And Lily starts just laughing and she goes to her purse. She pulls out her tube and her tube is like half by pinky. So it was a smaller diameter um, tube. And Sassy had been, you know, doing the uh, Gerson diet just to prevent uh, cancer because she already now had two sisters with one that had died of breast cancer, another one uh, diagnosed with breast cancer and also fighting for her life. And she was just preventing, trying to be preventative in her diet. And she was doing preventative enemas. So they were laughing and laughing hysterically about this particular subject of the enema tube. Anyway, so Lily uh, lived about 11 years after the diagnosis. And when I first met her, I couldn't believe it that she was still alive. And this was probably about three years after that original diagnosis. And so I interviewed her. I got the lowdown of the Gerson diet, what they were buying, everything organic, you know, no makeup, no hair coloring. It's, it's quite extreme. Uh, and juicing, a big, big juicing. There's professional juicers you can buy. And the type of juicing is very particular. But she was really doing this, and she was doing it every single day because she had three little girls, and she did not want to not be a mom. So she lived 11 years and only died after COVID. So she survived COVID and uh, was a real... Um, holy woman and taught me so much about diet because it threw me into this category. It's like, wait a second, I need to listen to my dad. My dad, here's my dad, a 
brilliant, brilliant cardiothoracic surgeon. <laughs> because of my pride, I didn't want to listen to it. Here's this woman who's telling me, your dad's on to something. Okay, so then I started this research to figure out for my patients and for myself, what is the best diet? And, and over time, what I've realized is it's very, I think, and this is controversial, genetic based. I mean, it's not going to be the same for everybody. And I know there's different doctors and surgeons who have their different diets. There's Dr. Atkins, who had the Atkins diet. Uh, he was a doctor. He, he We don't know what he died of. Like, did he die of cardiothoracic, um, cardio, cardiovascular disease because he was a pro kind of fat a high fat diet. Uh, there's Dr. Gundry, a cardiothoracic surgeon who's against lectins. Lectins are in anything like uh, nightshades like tomatoes and um, eggplants and peppers and you have to be very careful with what you eat. There's Dr. Furman who is a family practice doctor, I think maybe internal medicine, I think family practice MD who has the kind of Dr. Furman diet which is a plant-based diet which means no salt, no olive oil, uh, beans are good. Uh, um, you know, all these different kinds of plants are good, but meat is bad. Uh, so very unusual kind of diet, but it helps patients with cholesterol. And I've mentioned how one of my colleagues had a family, very strong family history of, of uh, people in his family dropping dead from strokes and heart attacks and cholesterol issues. And he was totally at high cholesterol. He went on anti-cholesterol medications as a surgeon, realized he was having some kind of early uh, mind issues, memory issues. He couldn't remember things and so maybe a little early dementia, impotence. He said, this is not going to work. And he went to meet Dr. Furman and did a full course with him and did the Dr. Furman diet. No medications, was able to control his cholesterol naturally. As he's gotten older, it's gotten harder and harder to do the Dr. Furman diet. He still does all the beans. He does a lot of the diet, but it's hard not to cheat. And I, as uh, recently as a couple of weeks ago, he was back on some anti-cholesterol medications, but that's a Dr. Furman's diet. Then there's Dr. Fong, and Dr. Fong, who I adore and love, he's a, a nephrologist. He has a wonderful diabetic diet, which is excellent. So there's a lot of great diets out there. My personal diet is a little bit more kind of uh, very low carb. I'm on a one meal a day diet, and I do f quite a lot of fasting, uh, a lot of vegetables, of um, a lot of salads. Uh, the only thing I could find that all the doctors agree on, and we're going to go through one more doctor in just a few minutes because it's quite interesting. Uh, they all agree water is good, filtered organic water is good. Um, they all agree, I would say, that carbohydrates are generally not good. Um, they would all agree that wild salmon is probably fine. And I think pretty much everything else is controversial. Seeds and nuts, very controversial. Uh, meat, no meat, controversial. The other two doctors I want to mention before I mention this last doctor is Dr. Sinclair at Harvard, who's a real deal. He's a good doctor. He, I think I trust his research and he's an MD at Harvard. Uh, he has some financial interests that are become a little controversial on, on YouTube, but generally I do trust most of his data. Uh, Dr. Longo is a PhD. And so he was kind of the real deal kind of uh, did that big experiment that you've heard me talk about in previous podcasts, which got published. He had a cage of uh, two cages of rats, both with advanced melanoma or aggressive melanoma. He fed one cage, the typical American diet, uh, which, you know, we feed our children every day. And the other cage, he gave a severe caloric restricted kind of fasting diet. And at that time, the American Academy or the American Cancer Society or Cancer Association recommended to feed cancer patients because they need to be big and strong and have energy for the chemo and radiation they're going to undergo. So feed cancer patients. So he thought that those cancer rats that were severely caloric restricted would die faster than the rats given the typical American diet with the melanoma cancer. But he saw the opposite. The, pa the, the rats that had the severe caloric fasting diet lived a percentage longer, I think it was 30% longer, so significant difference. So that's where he came up with the Dr. Longo diet. And I'm a big Dr. Longo fan, uh, but there are some issues with the Dr. Longo diet. Number one, it's crazy expensive and you can just do it on your own. And then there's some other issues with the choices he allows of carbohydrates and grains. So there's some controversy. And again, it depends. Do you have a family history of diabetes? If the answer is yes, I would say my dad's right. Uh, carbohydrates is like poison. And I hate to say it. And I can't believe I'm saying it, but I think he's right. So 
carbohydrate, low carbohydrate diet is very good. Now, the saying goes, the best diet is the one you can follow and be healthy. And that can be a little tricky. So you have to kind of think about, you know, the different kind of habits you form. And, and there's a great book I'm reading by Charles Duhigg on habits, which I highly recommend to everybody having any T difficulty with changing your diets and your habits with diet because it really helps you with the psychology of changing habits, especially if you're, you know, running to the donut or the, the soda machine or the chips machine or whatever it is. There are things you can do with habits. So those are the other two doctors I wanted to talk about. And I do really appreciate Dr. Longo and Dr. Sinclair's work, Dr. Fong, Dr. Gundry. These are great, I think, really, really good doctors that really mean well and want to help patients out there, as I know I do. Okay, the most controversial doctor is my dad. So my dad told me, I guess now three years ago, he was on the carnivorous diet. I was like, what the heck is the carnivorous diet? And both my sister and I, who are surgeons, were horrified, absolutely horrified. <laughs> like, we're never going to tell anybody this. We're going to keep this as a family skeleton secret. Uh, what are you talking about? Like, are you crazy? And so we were like just embarrassed and then soon to find out there's also now many people that are smart and are on this carnivorous diet which means eat meeting eating meat alone uh, so a couple of days ago I was in the library with my daughter and I came around the carnivore diet by Dr. Sean Baker okay and so I wanted to give it a chance because I know my dad is not stupid he's a really smart surgeon great dad he you know he does his best and he's a good doctor so I know he has the best interest of all of us in mind so I wanted to do some little research research on the car carnivore diet or the carnivorous diet or just meat alone. And so the idea is that you just eat meat and organic meat and and you don't eat any vegetables or fruit. And that's my dad's diet. And it's also Dr. Um, uh, uh, another doctor that's well known who's a psychologist or psychiatrist, I should say, or psychologist. Anyway, uh, Gord Jordan Peterson is on this diet also. And he's a psychologist, very smart guy. He does research. He knows how to do research. So there's something to this. So I think what I'm reading about, and this is a real deal doctor. He's an orthopedic surgeon, was in the Air Force. He uh, did quite a big tour in Afghanistan. He's done some research. He was also kind of overweight, developing metabolic syndrome as a very busy orthopedic surgeon, um, I believe in Texas, and then started doing research and found his way to the carnivore diets over the last two and a half, three years. In the book, he says he's been on just eating meat. The problem is that we don't have long-term perspective, uh, double-blinded is impossible, outcomes on diets, because it's so based on all the different factors that affect your general health, your genetics being number one, your lifestyle probably being number two and your environment around you. How much do you sleep? Do you stand? Do you exercise? Uh, what are the factors around you? What's your mental health like? Uh, so there's all these different, and what's of course your diet. So there's different factors that affect which diet is going to be best for you today this week, this month, this year, this decade, this century, it's going to change. And so I think the key component for you is to think about what are the diagnoses that are in my family. So if you have, let's say, a, a history of cholesterol and strokes and uh, heart attacks, I don't know if we really can recommend the carnivore diet, which is has some really positive benefits. He makes some very strong cases of why people might do really well on the carnivore diet. But if you have a history of diabetes, then carbohydrates are not good. And so what are you going to fill your belly with? Well, vegetables are great, but you're not going to stick on the diet. So maybe the carnivore diet might be better. And of course, the balanced diet might be even the best, but you have to think about which poison you're going to kind of decrease. And it depends on your genetics a little bit. So if you're having difficulty deciding it's hard to know who to go to because a lot of doctors don't talk about diet. A lot of nutritionists don't talk about diet and with the data uh, next to them, they don't really, they still sometimes follow the food pyramid of the United States, which I think is a travesty to our, to our children. So I think the best for sure everybody agrees on is of course take away the sugar refined sugar the carbohydrates the refined carbohydrates get that out no soda uh, just get all that junk food out that is the best most important plus a lot of drinking a lot of water that is the most important thing everybody agrees on that everything else needs to be decided kind of with a plan of what is your goal so if you have diabetes and high cholesterol that's probably the hardest one to treat naturally because then you're left with limited food um, you know we don't have data to say that you should be on the carnivore diet if you have diabetes and high cholesterol but maybe it is a good idea because we're waiting for that data so what what i would recommend you try is 
if you can, uh, first try decreasing all you can, the junk food, the sugar, don't even buy the donuts, the cereals, all those things, the canned soups, take away all that kind of stuff so there's not so much salt and you know junk in the, the food you're eating. Drink a lot of water. I think most people would agree that unsweetened almond milk or really almond water, but almond milk is safe. That's I drink a lot of that a day. Just be careful with the calcium, that you don't drink too much calcium a day because I know I do, but my uh, levels are normal. Um, so that's the two things that are very safe. Things like eating lean uh, kind of chicken, of course, and fish that's organic or and wild is probably safe. And pretty much, I think all the doctors would agree on that. There's maybe a little controversy with Dr. Furman, but most doctors would agree that wild salmon is probably safe uh, and drinking a lot of water. The next decision is going to be the tricky one. And I would be on the side of eating vegetables, antioxidants, because we're talking longevity, not just your current blood work, but vegetables is probably a good idea. If you are struggling with eating just carrots and peas, which have a lot of carbohydrates relative to other vegetables, maybe more of the carnivore diet might be a way to get you to be able to decrease your carbohydrates and then slowly kind of change your diet to the vegetable route. Uh, that's where I am right now in recommendations, and I still don't eat that much red meat, although this, of course, is quite, I'm going to finish this book and just see what it says. I'm more of the kind of paleo diet, keto diet. But again, if you're not going to be able to follow this diet, this is a waste of time. So you got to think about what you can do day to day. I'm a huge fan of fasting. We have a lot of data. Uh, Dr. Longo showed this in his data that fasting is the fastest way to kill cancer cells, slightly small cancer cells with m mutations, and it makes your own cells stronger. So the monks and nuns and people who have fasted and you know in any religion, the, the fasting has been a really beautiful uh, gift that we now have science to back up. So do not forget about fasting if you can, if you're safe to do it with the help of your doctor. And if you have diabetes, of course, always check with your doctor first between, before you do any anything recommended on any podcast, uh, but generally fasting is a wonderful option for patients that can, can handle it. And there's different types of fasting. There's, of course, the one meal a day diet where you only eat, you know, about a four hour window. And within that four hour, I still am eating a very low carbohydrate diet. Uh, some people do a 24 hour fast, some people do a week long fast, some people do a month long fast. But again, all of these fasting protocols have to be very careful to check with your doctor, make sure somebody's checking your sugars. If you're diabetic, for sure, I wouldn't do this without any without you have to have your doctor involved uh, of course if you have insulin super careful because you can die from a insulin crash so again be super careful with dieting fasting food changes if you have any diabetes or any other medical or metabolic syndrome but this is hopefully going to help patients at least know where to go so the, my favorite doctors are Dr. Longo for the anti-cancer diet. So if you have cancer in your family, Dr. Longo, Dr. Sinclair at Harvard are excellent resources, I think. Uh, Dr. Gerson, Dr. Mormon, more controversial anti-cancer diets, more of the older generation, but also have some valuable information on general lifestyles of what you should should and should not like put in your hair and the, the kind of how you should live your life and cleaning your house and pesticides and all that kind of environmental stuff. Dr. Fong is the leading, I think, doctor talking about curing your diabetes. He's a nephrologist. Dr. Furman is more of the anti-cholesterol, prevent stroke doctor. Dr. Gundry, cardiothoracic, anti-lectin, decrease inflammation in general doctor. Cardiothoracic surgeon, great doctor, I think, too. So those are the kind of key doctors that I recommend. And Dr. Baker is the only doctor so far that I'm sure there's others. I haven't gotten to their books yet. The carnivore diet. I think this would be, again, for patients that want to kind of decrease their risk of diabetes. But I just don't know about the longevity of all these different diets. My diet, Dr. Kramer's diet, is mostly of kind of pushing for you to find out about your genetic, your family history, base your decisions on what you eat based on your genetic history and your genetic makeup. And the name of the game is to decrease inflammation. And I think that's what all these doctors are really trying to do. They just have controversies on what they think the best way to do that is. Inflammation causes cancer, makes cancer worse. Inflammation causes death, makes death come on faster. So of course, things like exercise, sleep, uh, mental health, positive thoughts, prayer, meditation, I would add in daily mass and the daily rosary and weekly confession to that honestly uh, I think that's the longevity um holy grail and so please pass this on please send this to friends and family thank you for subscribing to our podcast please continue to send your suggestions and 
Have a wonderful day. Thank you.